A stunning but not surprising decision, the U.S. Supreme Court has overturned the Roe v. Wade decision which protected a woman's access to abortion services in the U.S. The question is, will that fight now come across the border? After all, Canada and the U.S. share many things beside that border, including problems of inflation, high gas prices and security. But is there anything our two countries are working on together to help? To talk about that and more, I went to see the U.S. Ambassador David Cohen at his residence on Friday. Now, he's only been on the job for seven months, but his agenda is already packed with war, trade, and the most pressing issue of all, inflation. Ambassador Cohen, first of all, pleasure to see you. Thanks for inviting us in. Well, thanks for, thanks for inviting me on the show, and it's a pleasure to host you here at Lornado. A little different. This, is my, this will be the first interview for me in the... Um, historic Lynetta, the residence for the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. And it's, and it's a marvelous place. We are in a time, both in the U.S. and in Canada, at inflation at 40-year highs, 7.7% um, here. It's affecting Americans at the pump and at the grocery store and Canadians. Um, a lot of it, everyone says it's about supply chains. What is the U.S. and Canada doing together explicitly to help people fight inflation? So, um, you know, inflation is, is clearly the dominant economic issue of the day in both the United States and in Canada. The economy, the macro economy is larger than any government, any official, and it's just not something that you can wave a magic wand and make inflation go away. It's a huge macroeconomic force. That said, there are a bundle of tactics and, and strategies that government writ large can and should execute in inflationary times. And the first of, of all of those is a central banking function. Um, it's, I'm, I'm not an elected official, so I'm allowed to say this. It is true that the major responsibility for managing macroeconomic forces in the economy like inflation is a central bank function. It's not a presidential or prime minister function. It's been, by the way, political. A lot of people say the central banks, both in your country and Canada, blew it because they didn't ease back quick enough, and that's, right. why, that's why we're in the panic. And, and when you say, I agree with you that it's become politicized, but I don't think some of that criticism is political. I think the criticism is by other serious economists who look at this issue and say the central bank should have done something differently. Then you've got elected officials taking that comment and politicizing it. So those are, I think those are two different stages of the same, of the same particular issue. But so there's central banking policy, simplest and things we've already seen is raising, is raising the interest rate. Um, and then there are, then there are, we can go to all the way to the other end of the spectrum and you look at some of the root causes of inflation like, um, like prices at the gas pump, like we mentioned earlier. And so you see micro tactics that, con that countries are considering, whether it's releases from the strategic oil reserves to increase the supply of oil. After all, price at the gas pump is ultimately a product of supply and demand. Canadians listening to you on that, you know what they're thinking. They're thinking, my God, Joe Biden's about to go to Saudi Arabia to say, please release more oil. They're, and I know Canada's got 300,000 more barrels, and I know that the U.S. is the biggest customer, but your friendliest neighbor had a pipeline called Keystone that Chrystia Freeland, when she met with Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, raised again, said, you shouldn't have canceled that because now the world's different. You've got problems in Russia. We have supply. It's reliable. Was it a mistake for Joe Biden to cancel Keystone given where the world is now, which would have helped in this situation, your consumer and our consumer? So um, I hope this isn't headline news. Um, after all, I'm Joe Biden's friend and his representative in Canada. But Joe Biden absolutely did not make a mistake in canceling the Keystone Pipeline. Um, and I can, we don't, we don't have enough time to run through every argument there. But we're talking about inflation, which is fair. As Joe Biden has said, it is the number one issue the United States faces. But it is not the only issue. 
And energy is not the only issue that Canada or the United States faces. You could argue that climate change is the existential issue of our generation, and that unless we get a hold of climate change and get a hold of the impacts of climate change quickly, we are going to cause irre irreversible damage to our environment. And by the way, that is, that is something that has a tremendous Canadian implication because of the adverse impact on the Arctic from runaway climate change. And if you are Joe Biden, and you're the President of the United States, and frankly, if you're the Prime Minister of Canada, you have to juggle not just inflation, no matter how important the issue is, not just prices of gasoline at the gas pump, but you have to focus on the whole range of issues but, that confronts your country. Right? And I, I appreciate but this is that important. about and so, I, But is Keystone the tipping point? I guess for I, a lot of folks, they say, look, you're, you're buying from Saudi Arabia. Buy from a, the world's change when Russia's invaded Ukraine. This is a friendly option to transition. And the oil sands are committed to transition. So the United States already purchases 62% of its oil from Canada. I mean, 62% of the oil we purchase comes from Canada already. And the, the numbers just don't support that even if Keystone were functioning, and if Joe Biden hadn't pulled the plug on Keystone, it wouldn't be functioning today. So it would have no current impact on inflation in the United States as a result of fuel oil prices. But if saving our climate, if saving the Arctic, of making sure that we come to grips with uh, but we come to grips with the, with the incredibly dangerous adverse impacts of climate change, well, that may be a price that is worth paying. Let me switch for a minute. Uh, on Friday, as we're speaking, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. This is not a surprise. It was actually leaked. There are lots of, the, the court, of course, most of the judges appoint, are conservative Republican judges. What is the significance for women and globally that, that Roe v. Wade and access to abortion rights are no longer constitutionally protected in your country? So as you say, this is not a surprise, um, but that doesn't mean that it is not a major disappointment. Um, you know, the significance of Roe v. Wade is that for 50 years, um, these rights were deemed to be constitutionally protected. I think it is a tremendous blow for what is a very important constitutional right for women in the United States. I remind everyone, but I'll be very careful about this because I'll be back in six months, um, that, the, that the Supreme Court decision today did not make abortion illegal. What they did is it removed the constitutional protection, as you said. So this now becomes a matter of individual states to determine the rules that will apply to, abor to abortion. So in a sense, the battlefield has shifted to a different governmental level. In the United States, the reason I want to be careful is because you've got such a large number of states under conservative, usually Republican, um, control where I think abortion rights will, be, will likely be restricted. A number of states have passed what are called trigger ordinances that essentially do prohibit abortion if the Supreme Court acts when so those provisions have essentially been implicated. Yeah. So this is a this is not a good day for for women, for treatment of women. Um, it is not a good day for our respect for uh, for for women um, and for their and for their right to choose what happens with their own body. All right, that's part one of our conversation. But coming up next, how concerned was the U.S. about the trucker blockade and the economic damage? And what should be done about the illegal guns flowing across the U.S. border? We talk about that and more with the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Cohen, next. Stay right here with Question Period. The trucker blockades in February dominated international headlines and prompted the federal government in Canada to invoke the controversial Emergencies Act. But just how concerned was Canada's biggest trading partner, the U.S., especially when the busiest border crossing in the continent, the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, was shut down? In part two of our conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, David Cohen, he pulls back the curtain on the U.S. concerns and weighs in on the problem of illegal guns coming across the border. 
Can you pull back the curtain for us, Ambassador, in February when we had the trucker protests both in the capital here, across the country, but for the U.S. specifically on the Ambassador Bridge? And we are in a debate here intensely about the necessity of the Emergencies Act. Was the U.S. government and pressuring Canada to resolve this because of the economic consequence on cross-border trade to get this resolved? So a um, little bit of that question mixes some apples and oranges. I, I don't want to get into the internal Canadian debate on the propriety of invocation of the Emergencies Act, sure. but I have no problem saying that the threat to trade and commerce between the United States and Canada as a result of the of blockades at points of entry, particularly in Windsor at the Ambassador Bridge, which is where the largest single implication was, We're talking about a few hundred million dollars a day of black of block trade. And so there was a high level of concern. There were repetitive high-level conversations with Christopher Freeland, with multiple ministers in the Canadian government, with members of the cabinet. I was personally involved in in many of those discussions, the White House got involved. Um, so it was a matter of serious concern, but nobody in the United States, to the best of my knowledge, ever said to Canada, you must resolve this problem. But it was critical. It, it was the, critical US, and the U.S. took it seriously. It was very serious. It should have been taken seriously, and it was taken seriously. Guns. The tragedy in Uvalde, Texas was just one of the latest, it was horrific. I know finally there's bipartisan support for some kind of gun control, not as much as Joe Biden wanted. In Canada here, there's also a move to have more gun regulation. But the debate in Canada is that the gun problem is coming from the United States. It's illegal guns coming over the border from the U.S. What is the U.S. doing to help Canada stop the flow of illegal guns from your country into this country? So I don't want to be provocative, but I don't know that there's enough evidence that the gun violence problem that is experienced in Canada is due either solely or maybe even primarily to illegal guns um, in the United States coming over to Canada. Because the fact of the matter is that there's not very good data on that question. It's become sort of accepted conventional wisdom, but not based on data. Buy it. Okay. But I don't, it may be true. I'm just right. saying okay. I haven't seen data to support that. But the answer to the question is that the U.S. And, the Can and Canada have to cooperate on cutting down on illegal guns coming into Canada if they are or if they aren't. We have had, we've had multiple collaborations and discussions about gun tracing and how we trace and how we can help Canada do its gun tracing because Canada just doesn't have the capacity. The, the RCMP just doesn't have the capacity to trace all of the guns. The United States has offered to help with that. And so it's part of a high-level collaboration around gun violence, all designed to crack down on the importation of illegal handguns, whether it's from the United States or elsewhere coming into Canada. January 6 hearing, we've been watching those about the assault on the nation's capital. Here in Canada, there's more concerns of another convoy coming around Canada Day. What do you make is there a threat to democracies from a rising populism, uh, or is this kind of an event that will pass, or is it a deeper concern? So I, I, think that, I think that question is an incredibly important question. I do think in the United States, in Canada, in all of the world's democracies, there is a disturbing growth of, of extremism, populist movements usually coming from the hard right. I mean, we see it in Germany, we see it in Brazil, we see it in the UK, um, we see it in the United States, we see it in Canada. It is, a, it is a real threat and a real trend. I think a lot of it is based on misinformation and is fueled by disinformation on social media. I think as a result, it is an extremely complicated question. And it's funny, we sit here around the Independence Day holiday and. United States in a country that was where was, was born on democratic ideals and and freedom of expression and it's a it's just an interesting time to reflect on what the future of democracy is in the United States and and elsewhere 
So you're talking to someone who is a democracy optimist. I firmly believe that democracy will prevail, it will survive, and that ultimately democracy will beat back autocracy. A Philadelphia until the end. Thanks, Ambassador. Thank you again. Thanks for coming. Thanks for letting us do this here.